Thanks for buying Cycle Sport magazine, Pro Cycling's most exciting publication. We hope that you'll buy Cycle Sport every month, so why not take advantage of our great subscription offers or reserve a copy at your local news agent? Hi, I'm Andy Sutcliffe, editor of Cycle Sport. You're going to love this specially compiled video, Great Moments in Cycling. Keep cycling and keep reading new Cycle Sport. Bye. Well, the place to be for world-class cycling is always Europe in April, May, because the World Cup classics are fought out in very close proximity to one another. The queen of them all is, of course, Paris-Roubaix. We still say Paris-Roubaix because that's where the race first started in the late 1800s, but nowadays it starts in the town of Compiègne, some 50 miles to the north of the capital of France. It invariably provides a great battle as it twists and turns around northern France, searching out those cobblestones that we always call the hell of the north. Canyon hasn't done any of the work, and yet despite that, the four riders covered the first two hours of riding. They covered 58 miles. And if they keep that sort of schedule up, then they're going to get down to Roubaix in record time. Here's the main field, two minutes, 25 seconds back. And the pressure now going on, because the riders always feel when they get to this part of the race, although there's still 68 miles to go, once they get to the forest of Arlenberg, decisions have to be made. That is sir. Uh, Van Poppel in the lead, and Duclos Lazal, Gilbert Duclos Lazal, is trying to go across the gap to him. This is Eddie Senor, he was in the chase group that was trying to make contact, and joining two at the back there is Taffy. And number 28 going through, well, that is the, uh, is uh, in fact Ludwig Williams. So Williams has come up to this group, he wasn't in the initial chase. So that is the MG Magnificio team rider, Williams, as we go out to the end now of the forest of Arlenberg, the crowd here at its thickest, the simple reason being, once they see Paris Bay go through the end of the forest, their cars park nearby, they're onto the nearby auto route, and they'll be able to rejoin the race further along, and they'll get there a lot quicker than the riders, because if you look at the map of Paris Bay these days, starting at Compiègne, about 50 miles from the Paris, in fact, then goes on a very circuitous route, making its way back to the bay. It certainly doesn't go on a straight line. Okay, with the peloton passing through the forest, Riders now having to hang on at the rear. There's still a very big field here. Sean Kelly has already experienced problems, by the way. He's had one puncture, and he's come back up to the field. So, too, there's another winner from Mary Bay, Eddie Pangalada. He's back up to the bunch, but they've both been involved in chases. Looking down the line here, Greg Lamond is very close to the front of this peloton. And so, too, I can see also there the sunglasses on the eyes of Ludwig, uh, Olaf Ludwig. Olympic champion, and of course this is Olympic year in Barcelona, but we now a professional rider, going to be defending the title from the Seoul four years ago. But you know the gap is coming down, it's now, it's now 31 seconds and Leger is telling Duclos Lazal, and I'm sure that's not the news he wants to hear because he knows the strength of Ludwig, he knows the pure speed and class of that rider, and the way Ludwig is pulling back Duclos Lazal right now, you know, they could come together at the entry to the velodrome and they could go onto the track together. It's as close as that. And the crowds now are shouting for Duclos Lazal because they know, thanks to television and radio, which is live throughout the afternoon, they know exactly what this, has, this man has done to get him here in the lead in Paris-Roubaix. 
He's not somebody coming out of the far distance and they say, oh, look, it's a Frenchman. They know exactly what he's done to get here and they appreciate the effort. And there is Ludwig and he's just going around the same corner, which we've just seen, in fact, Duclo Lazal go down. So I would say now we're inside 30 seconds. And Ludwig is coming back. Olaf Ludwig, and there's a car up the road there, but I don't think it's behind the Duclo Lazal. He's a bit further than that. But he's going to see. There's the helicopter you see above our picture there. Well, that is where Duclo Lazal is. The other helicopter now flying over Olaf Ludwig, and the main field behind, I think it's safe to say, are out of it. The Mond has done his job well there. There's just one rider escaped the pack, Olaf Ludwig, and he's got a real chance now of pulling back Duclo Lazal. France versus Germany, and the 90th Paris-Roubaix is going to be remembered as a great event, whoever wins it. The World Cup races roll to a temporary halt in mid-April. They make way for the big national tours, the Tour of Spain, the Tour of Italy, and of course the Tour de France, which was again a great race. It started in San Sebastian in Spain, and when I arrived there with Paul Show in my co-commentator, on the eve of the tour, we weren't too certain, we were very welcome. This is what happened. An incendiary device was placed under the car by a Basque separatist, and as soon as it went on fire, it took out six other vehicles with it. So we'd lost our car before the tour started, but things got better. As the race unfolded across seven countries, it again produced its stars, none more so than that great cyclist from Italy, Claudio Chiapucci. This is what he did on the mountains of the Alps on the road to Sestria. As we go up to the top of the climb now, the Col de Montchenny, and it's still the same man at the front. He's won every climb today in the Alps, and that is going to give him a near unassailable lead in the King of the Mountains competition. As we come up towards the top of the climb, we've got Bunyo and Injure now chasing them down. So the big names, it's been a struggle, but they've forced their way to the front here. Three minutes and 33 seconds down on Claudio Chiapucci, that's a long way. Chiapucci is still the leader on the road because this is a lot further back now to the climbing there of Lino. He's had a bad climb on Monsigny. And Andy Hampson's had a much better climb. He's come right up to the fore here. Goes over in fourth place with him is Franco Vona. They are just over four minutes down on Claudio Chiapucci. And so they're chasing now down the other side of the climb of the Mont Cheney. And if you look up the road, down there below us, and it is the world champion in the slipstream of Miguel Indurain. And the Mayo Jean, by the way, Lino, is five and a half minutes down on Chiapucci, and that will keep him out of the yellow journey. Chiapucci could be in yellow tonight. The man he's got to worry about, and indeed the man who's worried about him, is Miguel Indurain. He is now trying to chase down uh, Claudio Chiapucci, and that is going to be some chase. They've been joined there. So it looks as though Bunyo, Indurain, Hampson and Vona have got themselves together. Oh dear me, look at the face now of Claudio Chiapucci because he's on the last climb. This is the climb up to Sestriere itself. Surely he's not going to crack now. This has been an escape of magnitude. Some 190 kilometers in the lead so far for Claudio Chiapucci. And this will go in the history box as one of the escapes of any Tour de France in modern times. Indurain knows it too. And this is the first time we've seen Indurain come out in this race and have to take on the racing himself and not rely on his team to close this race down. The only time that Indurain has really put his own effort into this race has been in the first time trial at Luxembourg. He built himself such a comfortable lead there. He hasn't really had a chance or wanted to to do anything so far. But now he knows if he's going to save this Tour de France, he's got to stop Clear Pucci and he's got to stop him today. So Indurain. Bunyo alongside, and Bunyo will be content to see Indurain spend his energy now, maybe to find chance to attack him tomorrow on the long road to Alpe d'Huez, where he's won for the last two years, and indeed the only Italian ever to win, apart from Fausto Coppi, way back in 1952. Well, the crowd have been watching this on television, and they've been watching this rider out in front for four hours today. They've been watching him come slowly towards him, towards them rather, and Kia Pucci now surely can't lose this stage. And Bunyo's in trouble. Well, look at this. There's been an acceleration on the front. It was Franco Vona who's turned the screw a little tighter. And this has caused Bunyo to be in a spot of trouble. And I'm sure that Indurain has noted that. Well, he hasn't done a lot. He's tried to follow Indurain. And he's still lost ground here. So Bunyo will be very, very unhappy with his form so far in this year's Tour de France. 
long, long, steady climb this that brings them up to the top of the Sestria. A big crowd are waiting too, and Hampson is also in trouble here. Andy Hampson has tailed off. He falls back here to Miguel Indurain. Our camera's not allowed to go past these two riders by the international race referees. So we'll go back up and join Claudio Chiapucci. The gap is still there. It's coming down at the start of this climb with 10 kilometers to go to the top. That's six miles. He was leading by two minutes and 20 seconds on those four riders we've just seen, but they've split up now. Franco Bona here also trying to have a little go. The cheers of Bunyo on the right of our picture there. Indurain, Indurain trying to make his attempt here now to open up the gap. He's got to close this gap down. It's man on man now. Indurain isn't worried about his finished position today. He's more worried about the actual time gains of Claudio Chiapucci. Could be heading for the Mayo Jean right now because Pascal Lino is in terrible trouble and losing a lot of time today. The yellow jersey could be the return now after this marvellous ride by Claudio Chiapucci. will go down as one of the finest escapes I've ever seen in any of 20 Tours de France, and the Italians know it too. They're trying to coax, pull and drag their man home in Italy. The Tour de France very rarely makes an incursion into Italy. And surely now they're not going to allow Claudio Chiapucci to lose not just the stage win, but the manner in which he has won this race. He's not been afraid of anybody in this year's tour. He's attacked the minutes this stage has started. And I can't believe when he attacked at the beginning of today's stage of 254 kilometers, he really expected to be in this position now coming up to the finish. Look at this crowd. And even the motorbikes are in the way now. And this is really unfortunate because you lose your rhythm. And actually, Kier Pucci just asking the crowd to pull back. Let him see the road to the finish, please, at Sestriere. Now, that's 1992. But let's have a look back at some of my favourite moments now, the Tours de France and, indeed, the single-day classics of years gone by. All of these tapes are still available, and the ones for the shelf, believe me. Let's have a look, first of all, at 1986, the great battle between Bernard Eno, the five times winner at this point of the Tour de France, and the man trying to win it for the first time, Greg LeMond of the United States. This is on the climb of Alpduez, and the two top men are one-on-one. -on -one. And LeMond, spending his first day in yellow, still did not know if he could trust his own teammate, Bernard Eno. And he was right. Eno launched an attack immediately. LeMond was being forced on the defensive already. He was right to have sleepless nights, and he was possibly right to criticize Eno. But then without Eno, this Tour de France really would not have been great. With the yellow jersey of Greg LeMond right on his back wheel. And there's the kite flying in the sky today. It hails the end of the Alps as well. And fittingly enough, the two best riders to pass through the Alps and the Pyrenees. Eno first under it. Greg LeMond in yellow is second. And this is now coming towards the end of what has been a most memorable section in the Tour de France. The mountains again have produced the truth and produced two great men here and Greg LeMond must be feeling now as though uh, his Tour de France is coming a little bit closer. It's amazing as well to see them after all the rivalry that's been written about them in the press in the last few days after he knows go not going to help them all Lamont's not going to help Hino had to see them reunited in this day would have been a fantastic day really for these two riders to go away and just stamp their authority all over this Tour de France. Paul, this has been a Tour de France in the greatest tradition of the event. We thought these days had gone with the absence of Eddie Merckx, the man who won five times and always used to win so well. The absence of Jacques Ompetiel, uh, who in the late 50s and early 60s won the race five times. They used to destroy the field like no other riders could. Uh, but since then, the technology of cycling has become so uh, fine down that riders snatch bikes, quick wheel changes, always meant to tell them time gaps. They have only really to ride the bike and therefore winning by seconds and not minutes and yet here we are now in the most modern tour of its time and the two greatest riders have ripped the field apart and an arm goes round you know what has Greg LeMond said to Bernard the smile this is unbelievable the top of one of the hardest flights in the Tour de France and these two men smile LeMond is making this ball look like a club run now oh this is fantastic all oh, well, this climb it's look as if they've been out on a, a training ride together 
of both of them. You can see how happy they are now that they're going to going to be first and second over the line here. This is absolutely incredible. I'm going to ask Kathleen Yvonne to say something alongside me here. She can tell us what it's like now to see Bernardino and Greg come up the mountain. Kathy? It's fabulous. I'm glad to see they're such good friends still. <laughs> Well, what do you think Greg said to Bernard then? You win. Well, let's wait and see if what Kathleen Lamont says. Has she had it told Bernard? Like this. Watch. I knew it. I knew it. All right. <laughs> All right. There we are. The first time I've ever seen it. Two men coming up the Tour de France and now do it together. All right. The cheers are enormous. Well, of course, after that great victory by Greg LeMond back in 1986, we all know what happened after that. And Greg LeMond wasn't to appear in the Tour de France again until 1989. But what a race that turned out to be. With my co-commentator then for British Television, it was Paul Sherwin. I remember commentating on the final time trial from Versailles through to the finish in Paris, and then breaking down in tears. And I said to Paul then, I said, you know, we should never commentate again. We've just witnessed and talked about the finest bike race we'll ever see. And it was a great race, and it's a great tape. Here's an extract from it from Versailles. But maybe history will repeat itself. It was 200 years ago, during the French Revolution, that King Louis XVI was removed from his home, the gigantic palace of Versailles. The king was taken to Paris and was executed three years later. Is King Fignon also going to lose his crown? And the only man who can do it is Greg Lamond, and he certainly looks confident at the start in Versailles. If anything, Fignon seems overconfident. The ponytail Parisien can't even consider losing 50 seconds in 15 miles. For Delgado, the stage is a formality. He knows that he won't make two and a half minutes up on Fignon, but he's proud that he's proven himself. To come back from 198th place in Luxembourg to third in Paris has been a remarkable achievement. But Le Mans still has a one in 100 chance of winning this tour. He's riding his aerodynamic bike, wearing his aero helmet, and using his narrow aero handlebars. And he says he feels strong. The timekeeper counts down the seconds. And Le Mans is away on this ultimate trip. Two minutes after his American rival, Laurent Fignon enters the starting house. He too has his aero bike, but no aero helmet and no aero bars. The countdown begins. And now Fignon is underway for this 27 minute ride to destiny. Le Monde is a pure picture of power, approaching 40 miles an hour on this opening stretch. On reaching the River Seine at six miles, Fignon is 18 seconds behind Le Monde, a loss of three seconds per mile. At this rate, he'll lose the stage by 45 seconds but win the tour by five. Le Monde is relentless in his challenge, smoothly turning his biggest gear. in contrast is more erratic. He stands on his pedals in search of extra power, but he only breaks his rhythm. He's down 37 seconds, only 13 seconds left in hand, 4.7 miles to ride. Cathy Lamont can't believe that the impossible is coming true. But there's her husband, Greg. He's thumping down the Champs-Élysées, about to catch Delgado for two minutes.
Red Le Mans time trial is over, a time of 26 minutes 57 seconds, a record speed of 34 miles an hour. Cathy and her father-in-law gasp in astonishment. Greg Lamont celebrates in anticipation with his coach Otto Giacome. And there is Fignon. Can he still hang on to his crown? He's across the line and the clock shows a time of 27 minutes 55. He's 58 seconds slower than Lamont. Fignon has lost the Tour de France by 8 seconds. The smallest margin in the history of the Tour. There's only pain and sorrow for Laurent Pignon. And tears and joy for Greg Lamont. Delusion for France. And delight for America. Absolutely unbelievable. Greg Lamont, the back from his accident, was again the winner of the Tour de France. He had such a pull for this event. He'd now ridden it four times, he'd won it twice, he'd finished second, and he'd finished third. He was back again, of course, to defend the title in 1990, but there was a new name to take him on, Claudio Chiapucci of Italy. This rider was not unknown in the world of cycling, but he also wasn't thought to be a great bike rider. He'd ridden the Tour before, he hadn't done well, and in his first two years as a professional, he hadn't won a single race, but on that very first day, he was in a breakaway that gained many minutes, and that shaped the Tour de France right up until the final weekend. It was a marvellous Tour de France. Greg Lamont, you somehow felt, was going to win, but just how worried was he about Claudio Chiapucci? Well, as you know, this year, Claudio Chiapucci was a little better again. But let's have a look back now at life in the Pyrenees for the man in yellow. It wasn't Greg Lamont yet, it was Chiapucci. Chiapucci, out in front since the start of the Aspen, still has Brunil and three other riders for company. But when you are the race leader, you tend to have to do all of the work. While Greg Lamont here and Pedro Delgado rely on their teammates to set the pace. Greg Lamont has chased for most of the day. He has now caught his quarry, the race leader, the Mayo Jean, and he sits and watches him. The face of Le Monde gives nothing away. It appears he's climbing very well indeed. Fabio Parra attacks on the right, and Greg Le Monde is the first to react. Marino Lajaretta takes Le Monde's wheel. Conti follows, and soon everybody has moved across the road. There's one man, though, who finds he can't. The yellow jersey of Claudio Chiapucci is falling back. The gamble of the day appears now to have been the biggest mistake of the day. The crowd narrow the road down to just the width of a car. And Greg Lamont picks his way through and never once turns round to ask Injurain for help. To the final bend, and at last, Miguel Ingerain lines up for the finish. Greg Lamond is grateful for his back wheel, but not for long. Ingerain applies the pressure, just enough to crack the world champion. Greg Lamond's pace making up the hill had been formidable, but Ingerain now was thinking only of the stage victory. It reminded one a little bit of the battle between Greg Lamont and Donald Fignon a year ago on top of the Col de Perisord and Super Bagnier. Then, of course, it was Fignon going clear. This time, it was injury. Round the final bend, the finish banner was in sight, and after seven hours of riding at an incredible average speed of 39 kilometers an hour, the Spaniard Miguel Injurain wins this classic stage. Greg Lamond arrived just six seconds behind him. Had Greg Lamond taken the race lead? The clock was counting down. Claudio Chiapucci was alone now. He'd been alone for most of the day, really, because nobody had been willing to help him. 
he spinned it up to the line with the clock still counting down, and when he crossed it, he'd kept his yellow jersey by just five seconds. The great Kia Pucci was back. He was riding so well in the Pyrenees, so well in fact, he was to establish a race lead along with Miguel Ingerain. It was a great battle on a great stage in the Pyrenees, and Kia Pucci was no fluke. He was going to end the tour in third place. Claudio Chiapucci climbing with a great rhythm. Behind him was Charlie Motte and the tall figure of Miguel Ingerain, always following at this stage and watching for every move. He was now in his home area. He knew these roads so well. The big, tall, handsome Spaniard, though, was without his lieutenant, Pedro Delgado. He'd missed the move. Greg LeMond was here and riding extremely strongly, and so too was the other American, Andy Hampston. Toward the top of the tourmalade, Claudio Chiapucci was still setting the pace. The yellow jersey was hanging on in there too. But Greg LeMond was beginning to show signs of tiredness. He tried to attack on the tourmalade. It hadn't worked, and he'd fallen back. He'd been joined by the Italian, Roberto Conti. A little sprint, and over the top went Claudio Chiapucci in first place, followed by Injuane and Andy Hampston. Gianni Bugno checking over his shoulder there to see where the yellow jersey was. He was only a few seconds back. And so too indeed was Greg LeMond, 18 seconds back to be exact. The final kilometre, the red kite in the sky, and Miguel Injurain, as he so often does in the Pyrenees, was heading up towards the chance of a stage win. He's won twice in the Pyrenees before, in fact in nearby valleys. He wasn't going to win for a third time, as Claudio Chiapucci sprints ahead to take the victory by one second. Chiapucci's first ever big stage win in a major stage race. He was absolutely delighted. Claudio Chiapucci lost the Tour de France in the final time trial one year ago. He swore then he would learn how to ride alone against the watch, and he really did shock the stars when he recorded the best time at the first time check. Miguel Ingerain's fine performance in this time trial now was no surprise because, after all, he'd won the first time trial of the Tour de France, which now seemed a long time ago. And it was almost three weeks. At the first check, though, Chiapucci had been the fastest time, and Bugno and Ingerain had gone through in exactly the same time, 26 minutes and 57 seconds. They were both 21 seconds slower than Chiapucci. But whereas Chiapucci slowed down, Ingerain just kept his rhythm going. By the time he came to the finish, there was no doubt left, if there ever was, that Miguel Ingerain was going to win this year's Tour de France. Gianni Bugno was gaining nothing, and in fact, he was losing more time. Three minutes, nine seconds behind at the start of this time trial. By the end of the day, Gianni Bugno will be now three minutes and 36 seconds behind. Miguel Ingerain had chosen the four crucial stages of the Tour de France to strike, won both the time trials and finished second in the two serious mountain stages. He was the only rider to finish with a time inside 1 hour 12 minutes, 1 hour 11 minutes 45 seconds to be precise. He had won the time trial and now he would win the Tour de France in Paris the next day. Now the Tour de France is the great stage race in the world, but that's been going only since the turn of the century, 1903. Before that there were the place to place races, the classics, and the classics still exist. They're known as the monuments of the sport, and above all there are two races which are the very, very big ones. The Paris-Roubaix of 1990, I think, will go down as one of the finest races in the history of the event. And the event that races over cobblestones has got plenty of history behind it, too. Well, it was a battle between Eddie Plankett and Steve Bauer. And when they both arrived on the track, you know, if I'd have been the referee, I'd have given a dead heat. Speed of Bauer here now as he pounds that heavy gear over the cobbles. Very relaxed position for Eddie Plankett, too. He just sits there nicely on the top of the handlebars. Almost looks like he's on a Sunday run. Far more urgency in Steve Bow on the far side. This is the approach to the stadium. We'll turn right shortly into the velodrome. And here we go. Plankett is the first in. The no, I beg your pardon. Plankett the second in. Bauer is first in. The brakes are going on. It looks as though they want Plankett in the front. They're slowing right down, and this is going to let Guyon on, because I believe Guyon has been joined by Wampers out of sight of our camera. So we've got two riders in a couple of seconds. That's all, a couple of seconds off our camera. And they're coming on very, very quickly indeed. Into the stadium, Steve Bauer brings Eddie Plankett, and a big cheer goes up too, just behind Eddie Plankett. 
Edwig van Hooydonk again, no Frenchman present at the moment as they come onto the track now, but already in the stadium just behind them we have Vampers and there they are, there they are, right round on the inside, they're going to go straight through, this will be a stunning blow to Eddie Plankett, he didn't expect to see anybody, now he's seeing his teammate and the winner a year ago, Jean-Marie Vampers leading immediately, Plankett takes his wheel, so Vampers is looking to lead out, Plankett for the sprint, the bell and one lap to go, five riders fighting out now, the finish of Paris-Roubaix, Bumpers looks content, even as last year's winner here, to help Eddie Planker take the sprint. Bauer is in the back of the group, but Van Hoyedon goes for a long one. He's the least likely to win the sprint. Bauer gets his wheel, a good piece of riding by Steve Bauer. Planker tries to come on him too, but look at this ride now by Van Hoyedon. Goes high, opens the door to Steve Bauer. Bauer comes on the inside, and it looks as though Steve Bauer is going to get that first class victory on the line. They are almost together, and you know Eddie Plankett was right on him on the line. We'll have to look at that again, but there was nothing in it at all. Absolutely nothing in it. Here's the group sprint coming in. I know what my decision would be, a dead heat, and I think it would be the fairest result, but I'm sure they'll come up with the answer. Let's have one more look at it from this direction. Steve Bauer on the right at this stage was in the clear lead. I don't know where Eddie Plankett found it from. His eyes were shut, though as he just lunged his bike at the line. Watch the white line. Oh, it's possible that Plankett has shaded it. And in fact, they are saying that the victory has indeed gone to Eddie Plankett. The scrummage is on here as the cameramen seek out the Belgian. He has finally won Paris Roubaix in the eighth time. And there he is, Eddie Plankett, the winner of Paris-Roubaix in the closest finish in the history of cycling. The official verdict is one millimetre. And while we watch Eddie Plankett here, let me give you the complete result. A win for Eddie Plankett of Belgium for Panasonic. His time, seven hours, 37 minutes and two seconds, beating Steve Bauer of Canada by a millimetre. And everybody's heart must go out to Steve Bauer from the 7-Eleven team. You know what a gentleman Steve Bauer really is. He never argued that decision. He just walked out of the stadium with just the masseur to console him. Fancy losing Perry Bay by a millimetre. Can you believe he slept that night in bed? I can't. Eddie Plankett was the winner, and he's a local boy because Belgium is just across the border from France in Roubaix, and everybody there was supporting the Belgian victory. Well, Steve Bauer has an affinity to Perry Bay, and although 1991 won't be remembered for a good season for Steve Bauer, the 1991 Paris-Roubaix certainly will. He was in the result again. This time, though, he was being beaten by a lone French leader, Marc Madio. The same Marc Madio who almost picked up the World Championship later on in the year in Stuttgart. This is back to the leaders now. This is Ballerini, and it looks as though there's been an attack here. Ballerini and John Tarlin are the two riders here at this group. We've gone back up, and I, we've missed, unfortunately, our French cameras have missed this breakaway. But a rider has jumped, and it must have been soon out of that far bend we saw. Well, they're coming towards the end of zone number two. Tarlin chasing. Ballerini is here. And we're off zone two now. The fact our cameraman is with the two leaders. No, he isn't. That's Wilfred Peters, who's come through. I was about to say that it looks as though the group had split up, and it certainly has. There's one rider in the lead. And, you know, I think it's got to be Marc Madio who's gone ahead because Ballerini is chasing. Sergent is still off the back of this group. It is indeed Madio. So Marc Madio has attacked in exactly the same place where he attacked and won this race back in 1985. And I keep thinking now about the conversation with Christian Remer, who said that watch out for Marc today. He's got good form. He gave us some indication in last week's Tour of Flanders, in fact. He was in the lead group there, working hard in the break. Well, this is his 10th Paris-Roubaix, Madio. He's still around 10 kilometres to go to the finish. It's quite possible now, because the whole field is spread-eagled over the road behind him. And now comes the moment of the jersey straining possibly, the two-arm salute. Marc Madio is back in the big time. And a great, great ride. And here's the chase, and this group has got rather big all of a sudden. Peter's lead, this is Jean-Claude Pelotti leading them out. He's come from nowhere, Ballerini is up there as well. 
Wilfred Peters and Steve Bauer has latched onto this. Five men down. Bauer must have caught this group in the last kilometre. We never knew that Bauer was chasing. He was on one of our pictures, and Bauer has got up for this group. Well, a second place for Steve Bauer wouldn't be a bad defence, would it? John Claude Colotti, the French sprinter, leading them out. Ballerini in second place at the moment. It looks uh, as though we've got Wilfred Peters there in third place. Steve Bauer going high on the banking. Bauer going high. Carlo Bowman's taking him on. Bauer on the shoulder now of Ballerini as Jean-Claude Colotti. Bauer has gone into the slipstream of Ballerini. So Colotti now coming round towards the finish. Another Frenchman in the fight yet again. Bauer poised to jump. Bauer goes now. A couple of lap riders on the inside who are a lap behind them. And as they come onto the line now, Jean-Claude Colotti. Bauer's on the left. Bowman's on the right. And Colotti takes it. That is a French 1-2, and that's not been done since the Policia brothers did that back in 1921. And this is the winner, Marc Madio of France, Jean-Claude Colotti in second place. And third is the Belgian rider on the far right of our picture, Carla Bowmans. And Steve Bauer, what a superb ride by Steve, contacting this group almost in the velodrome and getting the legs to get up for fourth place for the Motorola team. So those are two years of Paris Bay, both different races and both equally exciting in their own way. Further down in Belgium, you know, down in the Ardennes, it's the most beautiful part of the world to be. And it's there where they run Liège, Bastogne Liège. And this is the oldest classic still running. And it's always a great race. It's one everybody wants to win. It's for a very different type of rider. It's for a rider who enjoys the hills and they come thick and fast. And this year, one rider wanted to win it above all, Claude Cacillon. He was wearing the colors of the champion of Belgium. But the great cyclist was about to retire from the sport. And being Belgian and coming from the area, because he's a Walloon-speaking Belgian, that means he speaks French rather than Flemish, Claude Cacillon was really out for victory. But he found men on form he may have not have expected. Men like the Italian, Moreno Argentin, and the new leader of the World Cup, Rolf Sorensen. This is Argentin and Cacillon now. It's interesting to see that Argentin himself is setting the pace in pursuit of his own teammate. Now, I suspect this was the plan for Sorensen to go away and Argentin to use his strength to counter the move. And it looks as though Cacillon is going with him. And this is a superb piece of riding by Claude Cacillon because this is the one climb where you've got to start reducing the size of this breakaway. Cacillon is not the world's greatest sprint finisher and he'll want to shed quite a few of these riders if he can. And this is a powerful piece of riding by Claude Cacillon. Sorensen still clear by about 20 seconds. Cacillon towing along now, the one man he doesn't want, of course, Moreno Argentin. And this is going to put both Ariostia riders up front. And along with Claudio Cacillon, somebody else is trying to get across the gap there as well. Champion of Belgium really rising to the occasion today. He's saying his farewell to the Ardennes in the best possible manner. And this is further up, this is Rolf Sorensen in the lead. Still wondering why they haven't caught him yet, he's just kept the tempo going. Indurain has joined the other two. So this has split the breakaway now, completely in fact. Four of the riders have gone forward. We've got three of them here, Sorensen is up ahead. This is the end of the steep part of the climb. We just we go round this bend and then there's a chance to settle in a little bit. Snip it up to a little higher gear. There we are, confirmation of the group chasing for Kilion, Argentine and Durain. And a look down the climb. There are the four chasers. So there are two riders. There they are too. There's two riders dropped off from the back of the remaining six. Stephen Roach is in that chase group. So too is Eric Van Lanke, I saw. And the crowd appreciating the good, honest effort here by the three leaders. Heading up towards the finish now. And you see the official car has gone through and he wants to pull out everybody behind. There they are, kicking them all out because the group now is almost on their back wheel. It's about 10 seconds, the gap between these four and the Roach group. So the chase after all these kilometers is now coming down to almost eight men. Last little climb in Liège, Baston Liège. Van Lanka was alone when he came up that climb one year ago. Now he's in the group behind because once they flick onto the road here, they'll see the finishing line. Sorensen in the lead. 
and it's Sancho who's going to lead out now. Crick is going in the centre, and Argentine to our left is now giving everything he's got here. Injurain is out of it, but it looks like Argentine is going to take on Claudio Capillion. This is an inspired sprint by Capillion, but it's not good enough. Moreno, Argentine, and a salute there too from his teammate Rolf Sorensen, and a congratulatory pat on the back from Claudio Capillion. The same one two that we had just a couple of days ago. And Moreno Argentine delighted, but what a superb ride by the champion of Belgium in his final Liège Baston Liège. You have to feel sorry for Claude Coquillon today. They're the two boys who did it just right. Stephen Roach is in now. But Ten seconds was the final gap for Stephen Roach, and he came in in eighth place. <laughs> that was a terrifically hard chase just after Lara Dube, wasn't it? And, uh, if the other some of the guys had maybe believed more in their chances, maybe we would have been able to get back. Yeah. But like, I don't think the lads really believe we could could get. Are we seeing the start of the form of '87? I think it's. Uh, I think I think I finished eight today. I think in '81, my first year pro finished eight as well. <laughs> maybe have another ten years to go. Yes. The second second generation of Stephen Roach. <laughs> well done. Second second star. Stephen Roach, uh, what a nice man he is. And there's Moreno Argentine, who has become one of the champions of the Ardennes over the years now. This is his fourth Liège Baston Liège. And if you're tired of hearing my voice by now, well, two of my favourite videotapes of all time are of a little bit earlier than when I was around as a commentator. In fact, I was doing my first tour de France when these snatches came in the tour of Italy. This was Stars and Water Carriers, and the other film is Sunday in Hell. It predicts the great performances of a very great cyclist, Eddie Merckx. At the foot of Paganella, the second mountain of the day, the leading group has grown to nine men five of these are Spaniards. But now Mex takes over the command. Goes out in front, sets the tempo up. Now on a new climb, it looks as though Mex will force a decision. The pedals must be pushed to the limit if you're not to be left behind. Gimondi passes Fuente and takes over his place at Mex's rear wheel. Bataline, Lascano, Fuente, Zilioli, Goldos, Adja, Pesaradona, on and on. That's his way of dealing with the climbs. He doesn't use Fuente's sudden accelerations. But he has a tough, uniform march rhythm that has the effect of slowly torturing the others. Gimondi keeps glued on to his rear wheel, but it's a murderous pace. The leading group is at breaking point hard to keep up. Especially for the Spaniards, they're feeling the pinch. To increase the pace now, it's surely impossible, inhuman, for any other than Eddie Merckx. Merckx is 50 meters in front of Gimondi and Batalin, and 100 meters in front of Fuente. Bataline tries to take Gimondi by surprise. But it doesn't work. And Gimondi immediately rides up alongside his young rival. A little further back, Goldos and Fuente are fighting to limit their distance. Max continues on his own. He's playing his trump card, even though it's not really necessary.
two Brooklyn attackers still have a slight advantage. It can't go on for long, because Merckx, as usual, has assumed the role all the others are eager to see him in, the lead position. Once in front, he heads the pursuit like a locomotive. It falls into place for de Vlaaminck. Merckx now has to ride after the breakaway, which de Vlaaminck has organized. Merckx is causing the group to string out. The new pack is about 40 strong, here where the paving stones of hell start again. Barely two hours of the race remain, and a more comprehensive sorting out is imminent. Soon the long column will be thinner. Another fall. The battle for a place is hard and dangerous on the sharp stones, where the speed is again fast and furious. And Pulidor is furious. He wants a wheel, and now. There's some very fast riding now. It's difficult just to keep position, to keep your rear wheel. Martins, De Meyer, Dirix, Godefruit, De Vlaaminck and Merckx, leading. Merckx attempts to break the others with his tremendous power. Walter Godefrude has taken the lead, and now it's his turn to force the pace so that it hurts. Godefrude, the former winner of Paris-Roubaix, seems in good form and is riding very well. With his smooth, powerful technique, he's a real expert in this terrain and is not nicknamed the Bulldog of Flanders for nothing. And suddenly it happens. Four men have broken away. Godefrude, de Meyer, de Vlaminck and Kuiper. De Vlaaminck looks back and proceeds to increase the speed even more. Notice de Meyer tucked into de Vlaaminck's slipstream. He's riding for himself now. The crash by his Captain Martins has released him from all obligations. The remainder of the field are a couple of hundred yards behind. Two men have separated themselves in the midway between it and the breakaways. They're the two Frenchmen, Poulidor and Donguillon, desperately trying to include themselves in this undoubtedly decisive escape. De Vlaaminck makes the tactical error of riding a long sprint from the leading position. Moser attacks from above, but he doesn't box in De Meyer, who slots in between them and rides a really explosive finale. First, Mark De Meyer. Second, Moser. Third, De Vlaaminck. Eddie Merckx, inscrutable as ever.
Roger de Vlaminck, disappointed and furious. Mark de Meyer, the happy winner. And that was Paris-Roubaix, 1976. A great race with a surprise winner. A year with a very special character, Paris-Roubaix, 1976, and it will be remembered as a race of fluctuating fortunes in the dust of the Enfer du Nord. In a week or so, the same cast will be assembled, the same actors, the riders, the journalists, the officials. The rivalry will continue, but few will have forgotten that Sunday in hell. You know, for me, Eddie Merckx has been the greatest bike rider of all time. I was privileged to grow up with him as a racing cyclist when he was an amateur, and then as he became a professional, I was rather pleased I was just a journalist, because certainly I wouldn't have been very good racing alongside him. There's also one other video we have on stock here called The Course on Tet. It's a real nice insight, and it does give a lot of footage of Eddie Merckx. Some of the dialogue, a little bit in French, but believe me, you will understand the film, and you will like the pictures.
Until the next time when we meet, remember this. Keep cycling and don't give up. The very best to you. Goodbye.